Hello, this is Chris Bennett. Join us weekly at Pot TV on the Burning Shiva Hour as we explore the roots of cannabis culture throughout history and around the globe. On PotTV.net, home of the herd. Hey, Pot TV fans, lots going on in the world today. You know, looks like we're getting pretty close to war there in Iraq, possibly, and uh, much stuff happening in California, the marijuana movement, you know, and in these times of persecution, uh, potential global war, and ecological disaster, it's hard not to get caught up in the apocalyptic uh, visions of doom and judgment they uh, popularized by the modern uh, Christian mythos of, uh, of revelation, you know, and this is something I've discussed before here on uh, the Burning Shiva Hour, my three-part series on uh, the book of Revelation. But few people know that the concept of the end of the world and a judgment day aren't ones that originated in the Bible, but they came from the Persian cosmology. In fact, many of the so-called Christian beliefs such as heaven and hell, a coming savior, uh, um, the devil uh, ruling over some sort of hell-like place, all come via the Persian religion. And even more interestingly, these Persian shaman, known uh, popularly as Zoroastrians and also as the Magi in the Bible, had their uh, visions of such things on super large doses of cannabis. And uh, um, cannabis is responsible for the concepts of the end of the world and uh, the heaven and hell and many of these things. Cannabis visions, shamanistic cannabis use. And it's little wonder that these uh, Magi were known as the drug peddlers of the ancient world. Now, Zorster was thought to have lived about 2,500 years ago, uh, um, and uh, um, his uh, uh, philosophy led to the Persian Empire and his uh, religion, softly called a monotheism, but more of a dualism, uh, um, as it involves the concept of a, a god of pure light and goodness and a god of pure darkness and evilness, you know, Ahura, uh, uh, Mazda, and Iraman, uh, um, uh, respectively. Now, interestingly, uh, um, the Zoroastrians were very strongly environmentally inclined, and to pollute land or water was a sin uh, by Zoroastrian standards. And they were very uh, concerned about lying, and, and many of the uh, thus many of the Christian concepts of good and evil and uh, its effects on uh, um, life uh, uh, come via the Zoroastrian religion. Uh, now, the, the exploits of Zoroaster, it should be noted, may in fact uh, uh, describe a number of uh, different Persian shaman all commogurated into one figure, much like Moses may also represent a number of uh, individuals whose exploits have uh, been uh, um, contrived to one mythological figure, but it's really hard to tell. It really happened all so long ago. Now, Zoroastrianism is thought to be derived from Mazdanism, an Aryan religion that uh, derived from somewhere in the area of the Hindu Kush Mountains. And uh, this group's uh, probably, uh, from being attacked by uh, some other culture, ended up splitting, and some ended up in Persia, and then some went uh, south uh, to India. And this led to uh, um, the development of two, you know, uh, the stream of two different uh, religions, which are based the same. And thus, we have in the Zoroastrian religion uh, references to Heoma, which is identical to the uh, Sanskrit Soma uh, of the Rig Veda. And uh, people interested in finding out more about Soma and Heoma can check the series of the, the 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 episode of Burning Shiva I did on the Soma Heoma and the potential uh, botanical candidates of this plant. Soma, or also known as Heoma, was a drink used uh, by uh, uh, the Hindus in India and uh, um, Zoroastrians in Persia for uh, religious purposes, and it's thought to have been a number of different plant candidates, as I discuss in that episode. Uh, um, more recently, archaeological evidence uh, um, described uh, in Richard Rudsley's en Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Substances indicate there's uh, archaeological evidence uh, indicating that cannabis was in fact uh, one of the key uh, components of this Heoma drink and it was mixed with ephedra. So there is uh, some pretty strong uh, uh, indications of this as well as, uh, as the Zoroastrian sites such as this one over here where there uh, have translations of uh, 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 um, the Spenta Manu or the Gatha, uh, um, which is the works of Zoroaster, we see that they also tie in uh, um, uh, Heoma uh, with the marijuana. So um, even some Zoroastrian sources themselves consider it to uh, to have been it. Now, 
Uh, unfortunately, the, or I don't know whether it's unfortunate or not, but uh, at some point in some of the Zoroastrian literature, Zoroaster seems to condemn the uh, use of Haoma as it was uh, associated with massive horse sacrifices and uh, um, uh, large sexual exploits on the part of the priests and stuff at the Haoma ceremony. And he reformed the religion somewhat and uh, um, seemed to have eradicated this. But uh, it's not really quite clear if he just eradicated some of the rites or not because another plant seems to appear uh, popularized in the uh, uh, Zoroastrian literature around the same time. And that is Banga, which like its counterpart in India, Bang, was a preparation of cannabis hemp. The Zoroastrian references to Banga are said to co have come down to us through one of the few surviving books of the Zen Devesta, the Vendidadad, known as the Law Against Demons, and it calls Banga Zoroaster's good narcotic. This ancient reference indicates the plant as the favorite entheogen of the Persian prophet, and later Zoroastrian writings refer to Zoroaster's use of hemp for shamanistic ecstasy and initiation. According to Merce Eliad, who is probably the foremost authority on the history of religion, shamanic ecstasy induced by hemp smoke was known in ancient Iran. Professor Eliad and other respected religious scholars along with a number of hemp historians have proposed that Zoroaster used hemp to bridge the metaphysical gap between heaven and earth. Indeed, the plant was such important to the ancient Zoroastrians in the Zen of Vesta that hemp occupies the first place in a list of 10,000 medicinal plants. Now, although such powerful experiences as those described in Zoroastrian li uh, writings would seem unlikely to most Western users of cannabis, as Dr. Michael Aldrich explains, there is a myth that pot is a mild and minor drug. Usually in context of American usage it is, but it doesn't have to be. The hard part about expressing this, however, is that the anti-marijuana people who pose visions of disaster about hashish or about legalizing the stronger forms of cannabis are also wrong. In and of itself, there's nothing wrong with cannabis being a potent hallucinogen. This is certainly accounted for in the vast popularity through these many centuries. When one seeks a shaman's drug, one generally wants something more powerful than a mild hallucinogen. Of course, knowing when and where to use cannabis at dosages or strengths suitable for real visions is also important. It's obviously not a good idea to try and find, try this in an unrefined social context or when working in the fields or factory. The use of cannabis has this use of cannabis has traditionally been confined by rational uh, custom in ancient societies to rituals which help to define, control, measure, and magnify the raw experience. Now, Zoroastrianism um, incorporated no form of meditation or uh, uh, other techniques for deriving. Uh, um, inspiration from, from their God, except for cannabis. This is where all their religious re revelations came from, is from ingestions of Haoma or Banga. And uh, um, we can picture Zoroaster much like uh, Moses, who, who's uh, roughly, you know, not that, that far away in time, time span, uh, as a, a, a primitive shaman who ingests a psychoactive plant and uh, questions his mind about the troubles of his tribe and people and then receives some sort of uh, thoughts back which he interprets as divine revelation. Uh, um, so it, it, again, you know, it's uh, pretty interesting that here again at the beginning of another whole religion, much like the use we've discussed uh, in, in other religions, uh, uh, um, particularly the Bible for, for a lot of you people that have been watching my series, here again at the birth of another religion, we find the use of cannabis and one that's really, in a religion that's really closely associated with the Bible as we'll discuss. Um, now, in time, Zoroaster perfected his uh, method of hemp-induced shamanic ecstasy and began to initiate others into its mysteries, including his own wife, Havove, who prayed that she be given the good narcotic banga, that she might think according to the law, speak according to the law, and do according to the law. Amongst other cannabis initiates can be counted the Zoroastrian heroes Gustap and Ardu Viroth, who after drinking bang were transported and sold to heaven and had the highest mysteries revealed to them. These agent out-of-body experiences are classic examples of what is known as shamanistic, e shamanistic ecstasy and shamanistic flight. The belief that the soul actually left the body in these magic rituals resulted in the belief that this occurred also at the point of death, giving rise to the belief in an afterlife. Ardu Viraf's vision is of particular interest to modern readers as they are considered to be, by religious scholars, to be the root of the Christian concepts of heaven and hell. After partaking of an extremely strong psychedelic dose of marijuana, 
Ardu Viraf lay in what appeared to outsiders as a death-like coma and had a classic out-of-body experience in which the agent Psychonaut believed he traveled on the mythical Sinvat Bridge to heaven where he witnessed all dwell among fine carpets and cushions and in great pleasure and joy. Viraf, after returning to the bridge, was then taken to hell that he might see the lot of the wicked. He saw the greedy jaws of hell like the most frightful pit. Everyone in hell is packed in so tight that life is intolerable, yet all believe that they are alone. Amazingly, over 2,500 years later, many modern believers in the concepts of heaven and hell are still deeply influenced by the uh, cannabis-induced visions of Ardu Virav. It was a good 10 years after his own uh, um, religious revelations induced by cannabis that uh, Zorster uh, was able to bring this uh, religion to a level that it was celebrated all over the kingdom. And this has to do with his conversion of King Vishtaspa, who was uh, given uh, cannabis preparation by Zorster. And uh, while well, his body lay in sleep, his soul traveled to paradise. Now, interestingly, Vishtaspa's visions uh, um, are said to be the origins of the whole concept of an apocalypse or a holy Armageddon, as he was one of the first to conceive of a beginning and end of history, placing himself in Zarathustra, Zarathustra at the midpoint of history. Now, Vishtaspa's eschatological vision was prohibited literature in ancient Rome, <coughs> which is not surprising, as an oracle attributed to the king was credited with predicting his downfall. Vishtaspa's vision, known as the Great Renovation, foretold of a coming savior and the institution of a powerful Eucharist, the White Home, a mythos that would directly influence the Judaic and later Christian concepts of a Messiah. Now, the Zoroastrian influence on biblical prophecies of the end of the world extends far back through the book of Revelation and to even earlier versions of the apocalyptic prophecies as described in the Old Testament period when the ancient Jews were under Persian rule. The prophet Isaiah referred to Cyrus, the great, the, the great of Persia, as the anointed of Yahweh, whom Yahweh himself led to subdue nations before him, that gates may not be closed. Yet historically, Cyrus, referred to in the Old Testament as the king of kings, and in return the different peoples that had been conquered to their homelands and restored each of their gods to their temples, continued to worship the god of his own ancestors, Ahura Mazda. Perhaps at that point in history, little differentiation was seen between the one god of the Hebrews and that of the Persian monotheists, Ahura Mazda. Possibly, the sacramental ingestion of cannabis in both cultures, the Hebrew cannabis of anointing oils and incense and the Persian drink Bam, served as a meeting point, as it always when brothers and sisters of different ends of the earth come together to share this holy herb. After the time of Zoroaster, the figure of this world savior, uh, the Sociant, as it was known in Persia, merged with one, with one of the older pre-Zoroastrian Vedic gods known originally as Maitra Varuna, but later more popularly as Maitra, the unconquered son. The Miryas has a Mura master declare, when I created Maitra of the Bad Pastures, I made him worthy of veneration as myself. The god plant, Heoma, was then consecrated as the priest of Maitra, and all further Heoma sacrifices were made in Maitra's honor. The worship of this god in its seventh stage system of initiation became popular in the ancient world, uh, um, and up until about 300 AD, it rivaled Christianity for the attention of the masses. Now, Maitra is a particularly interesting god uh, when it comes to discussing uh, the history of Christianity, because up until uh, uh, um, uh, through about 350 A.D., uh, uh, December 25th was celebrated as Mithra's birthday, and like uh, uh, Jesus' myth, he was said to have been born in a cave and uh, discovered by uh, uh, um, uh, sheep herders or something or magi. You know, they came and uh, announced his divine birth on December 25th, and uh, Jesus' birthday was celebrated on January 6th. And Mithra was a very popular god, and the Christians, as they became more powerful, began to resent more and more of this uh, uh, foreign deity. Uh, um, upstaging their own uh, God's birthday of January 6th uh, um, and they took over the holiday and uh, much of the mythology of Mithra as well but uh, um, 
iconography or statues and uh, um, paintings and uh, uh, engravings from the period uh, uh, tell us a lot about Mithra's cult. And uh, in this following picture here, uh, um, it says that uh, Mithras uh, has to uh, slay the sacred bull offered as a sacrifice in order to save humanity. And from the blood of the wound uh, um, um, comes the drink of immortality or the Heoma. And in this depiction here, we see what appears to be a three-pronged uh, pot leaf and uh, may indicate the use of cannabis, uh, which uh, Professor Ruck and others have indicated was used uh, as an incense in Zoroastrian rituals. Other uh, elements, such as Mithra's red cap, uh, very popularly known as the Liberty Cap, from where the Liberty Cap mushroom gets its name, and depictions such as this one here, which shows the uh, bull uh, peeing in a cup, indicate that maybe mushrooms, uh, particularly the fly agaric mushroom, may have been associated with uh, um, the Mithraic cult as well. Um, and then there's strong indications of this because there's references to drinking urine and stuff in its, uh, in its ritual. And, uh, um, Interestingly, much like Jesus, uh, Mithras is said to uh, appear again to save his followers and offer them a uh, Eucharist uh, at the end of time, you know, when the final Armageddon comes. Okay, we'll stop there for a minute. Now, in light of this, uh, uh, the symbolism of the slaying of the sacred cow, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, um, religious scholar Paul Hamlin, who records that in the Zoroastrian creation myth, Ahura Mazda gave the first created ox cannabis to ease her discomforts in the throes of death after she was inflicted with disease and hunger by Ehrman, the Persian devil. If this is the case, then cannabis is more than a fitting plant to, to beneficially pour forth from the sacred animal, uh, animal's wounds as the white home or the uh, sacrament of the elixir of immortality at the end of time, you know, and in many ways I kind of think the whole slang of the bull thing kind of is a symbol for what's taking place in our own time. It's like uh, uh, sacrificing our sacred cow, you know, our, our old beliefs about many of the religions, these beliefs about Christianity and uh, um, disincarnate gods and stuff like that that by slaying those false beliefs and those uh, immature beliefs, those sacred cows, it is from that wound that we will see pour forth the shamanic plants, the entheogens, that really offer the salvation for humanity and a future for us all. And uh, that's something to think about in these trying times. And also, as one last note, since we're kind of talking Armageddon this year a bit as well, although the Persian Armageddon, uh, I want you to remember that I have it on the authority of both a doctor and a scientist that the number one medicine for survivors of a nuclear war is cannabis. It controls the nausea, radiation, uh, um, much like it works for cancer and uh, AIDS patients who suffer radiation treatment nausea. As well, uh, it's been shown effective in the treatment of anthrax and as well effective against nerve gas as was popularized by the Greenleaf Party in Israel recently. So make sure you have lots of cannabis on hand in these trying times. It could be the difference between making it through them and not making it through them. Either way, it's always a pleasure to have around the holy incense that served all our ancestors for so long. So on that note, I'll see you again next week on Burning Shiva.